Hi, I'm Dan Freed, creator of Biochemistry Literacy for Kids. This video will highlight some of the key features of my curriculum and will show how college-level science can be made accessible to anyone, even elementary school students. I believe that lessons like the ones that you're about to see can be taught by classroom teachers from first grade on up. Let's jump right in and take a look at the periodic table, which is where many of my lessons begin. The periodic table consists of 118 elements, but luckily living things mainly use only a few of them. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Here we see the color coding commonly used by scientists to represent these elements. In this lesson, we are going to focus on how the white hydrogens and the gray carbons bond together to form molecules. I'm now going to open PyMol, which is a free molecular modeling software, which allows us to view large biomolecules like this rhodopsin protein. Rhodopsin is the molecule in our eye which allows us to sense light. So we are now seeing the molecule that allows us to see. There's quite a lot going on here, uh, and uh, we notice plenty of blue nitrogens and red oxygens and some yellow sulfurs. Uh, but let's focus on the bonding patterns of the white hydrogens and the gray carbons. Rather than simply telling my students the rules of bonding, I like to send them into a protein and on a molecular field trip to discover the rules of bonding themselves. Students eventually will notice that the white hydrogen atoms always have only one bond. Everywhere we look, we see white hydrogen atoms connected to only one other atom. When we look at the gray carbons, another pattern emerges. I'm changing the colors here of the carbons to help us see the number of bonds that they make. Wherever we look, carbon has four bonds. Sometimes we see four single bonds, but sometimes we see two single bonds and a double bond. So great, it's nice to know some facts about bonding, uh, one bond for a hydrogen and four bonds for a carbon, but what causes this? Let's look at the atomic structure of hydrogen to find out. Hydrogen has one proton and one electron traveling around the nucleus in an orbital. Since electrons like to pair up, two hydrogen atoms will share their electrons so that the electrons are paired. A shared pair of electrons is called a bond. Looking back at our rhodopsin structure, we can now focus not on the colors of the atoms, but on the bonds. Every one of those bonds is a shared pair of electrons between two atoms. If we see a double bond, it must be two shared pairs of electrons, or four electrons shared between two atoms. Okay, let's now build a hydrogen molecule using pieces from this MollyMod kit. I'm going to simply assemble the H2 molecule uh, using two white hydrogen atoms and one of these gray bonds. But now we have a more of an appreciation of what this bond actually means. It's not simply connecting the atoms, it's actually representing a shared pair of electrons. Now let's move on to carbon. Since carbon is element 6, it has six protons in the nucleus and six electrons. But here, the situation is more complex. We have a pair of electrons orbiting in an inner orbital and four single electrons orbiting in an outer orbital. So what's this about? We need to look a little bit more in depth at the periodic table to find out. Let's count from element one to element six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You may have noticed that the first row of the periodic table has two elements and we counted through both of them. But the second row of the periodic table has eight elements, but we only counted through four of them. When we look at the structure of a carbon atom, we see a reflection of this. The first orbital is filled and the electrons are therefore paired. The second orbital is unfilled, so the electrons remain single. You may already see where we're going with this. Since lone electrons prefer to pair up, other atoms with lone electrons, in this case the four hydrogen atoms, can form four bonds with the carbon. This molecule is called methane and is an important fossil fuel. All right, now I'm going to build a methane molecule, CH4. I'm going to use a black piece and four hydrogens, of course. 
and we'll notice that the black uh, carbon has spaces only for four bonds, which is important. And um, the structure that we've created, this three-dimensional structure, has a specific geometry, uh, which is called the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron is a characteristic geometry of bonded carbons, and it shows up all over nature. So uh, when students see the structure, they're starting to see something that's going to be um, a universal sort of geometry throughout carbon-based molecules. Now those four lone electrons of the carbon can bond to many other kinds of atoms, including other carbons. If we satisfy the remaining lone electrons again with hydrogens, we've created propane, another fossil fuel. Because each carbon atom can make four bonds, there's an enormous variety of carbon-based molecules which are possible. I'm now going to show you some of the nomenclatures that chemists use to draw carbon-rich molecules. Here are the structures of methane and propane. Since carbon is so common, chemists sometimes represent carbon as a black dot. All three structures on the left mean the same thing, methane or CH4. Now what about when we have several carbon atoms in a molecule? Things can get very messy, so again the black dots for carbon nomenclature is used. But we can also eliminate the hydrogens from the drawing. Since chemists always know that carbons make four bonds, it's common to omit the hydrogens in these drawings. It's not that the hydrogens aren't there, it's just a shorthand. Finally, chemists can remove the black dots altogether, leaving only the bonds. Believe it or not, this V-shaped drawing means propane to a chemist, as do all the drawings on the right side. Now I want to give you a taste of some of the more advanced material from my classes. This structure is called retinol. The molecule is pretty complicated. It has 20 carbons, 28 hydrogens, uh, several double bonds, so we can see why we need to learn about the shorthand notation for drawing these molecules. Let's simplify the drawing first by removing the C's for the carbons, then by ignoring most of the hydrogens, then by showing only the bonds. Again, it's not that the hydrogens aren't there, this is just a shorthand notation so that our drawings are more legible. Okay, now I'm going to test your biochemistry literacy by showing you some incorrectly drawn structures. We'll see if you can find the errors in these rhodopsin structures and correct them. Can you find the mistakes? You may have noticed that we have a five-bonded carbon, which we know is impossible. There are only four unpaired electrons in a carbon atom, so there's no way that you could make five bonds. We also see that we have a carbon with only three bonds. Let's add a hydrogen back to show the corrected structure. Now this kind of question could easily show up on a sophomore organic chemistry exam, but we can see that with this very visual approach to learning, it takes just a few minutes for students to begin to access this kind of college-level content. Anyway, now that we've proven that we already have some biochemistry literacy, let's see what the purpose of retinol is in the eye. Let's bring up the pymol rendering of rhodopsin again. This time I'm showing the surface of the protein. We can peel away the surface to reveal the hundreds of amino acids that make up the protein. By zooming into its core, we find retinol with its multiple double bonds. I'm going to change the carbons to pink here so that the molecule stands out a bit more. Notice that retinol is connected to the rhodopsin through a nitrogen atom and seems imprisoned in a cavity inside the protein, so it must be needed for something very special. In fact, what we are looking at is the molecule that connects us with the visual world. We are now going to understand the molecular basis of how our eyes sense light. In the dark, one particular double bond in retinol, shown here in red, exists in a curled up C shape, which we call cis. But when excited by the energy of a light wave, the bond changes to a Z shape, which is called trans, which allows the whole molecule to extend out. Let's watch that again. Retinol is quite a unique molecule because it changes shape when exposed to light. Now let's see what happens to retinol inside the rhodopsin protein. We see yet another biochemistry shorthand nomenclature here. The spiral helical strands require some more explanation, but for now we can think of them as a representation of the protein's fundamental structure. We can see again that retinol uncurls itself when exposed to light. But since it is imprisoned inside this cavity of rhodopsin, the structure of the protein itself is forced to change as well. The retinol pushes on the surrounding atoms, forcing them to rearrange. 
Comparing the structure of the rhodopsin in the dark and in the light, you can see how much the structure around the retinol has to change to accommodate this switch from cis to trans retinol. When we look at the overall structure of rhodopsin in the dark and light, we see that this yellow strand pointed out here really changes shape a lot. This change in protein shape, which we remember began with just a light wave, begins a series of biochemical steps leading to the sensation of vision. Okay, so I have here the structure of cis retinol. Let's simulate what happens when the molecule is exposed to light. I call these handheld chemical reactions. One of the double bonds breaks and reforms, giving trans retinol, the structure with a more extended shape. Again, we can see the contrast between the two structures. So now we know a little bit about how rhodopsin functions in the eye to help us sense light. I want to show you one more connection to everyday life. Now that we know chemistry nomenclatures, this structure of beta carotene should make some sense to us. It's a very long and carbon rich molecule with many double bonds. And it looks a little familiar, doesn't it? It actually has two retinol molecules bonded together. Beta carotene, as the name suggests, is an orange molecule found in plants, famously carrots, and retinol is actually a purple molecule. Vitamins are molecules which are essential to life, but they're molecules that we can't make ourselves. We must eat them as part of our diet. Retinol is also known as vitamin A. Without it, our vision suffers. Beta carotene is a provitamin since it's the main source of dietary vitamin A. We have enzymes in our body to break down the beta carotene that we eat into two halves to create two vitamin A molecules. Wow, so we really learned a lot about biochemistry in just about 10 minutes. But this just scratches the surface of the curriculum that I've created for teachers to use. Uh, it's interesting to imagine what kids could learn if their whole science curriculum was like this. For more information, please check out biochemistryliteracyforkids.com. Thanks for watching.